Good evening, folks. Welcome, friends, to the August 2021 chapter of the Local History Guild. I'm your host, Mike Dyer, Curator of Maritime History here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And uh, tonight's topic is uh, we're revisiting all hands, uh, Yankee whaling in the, in the U.S. Navy. Um, we, uh, we, as you may recall, a few months back, we had Gordon Calhoun uh, of the uh, U.S. Navy uh, History and Heritage Command to talk about Brave Randall and the, and the Battle of Hampton Roads. Um, and that was that was pretty interesting. Um, and uh, so tonight we're gonna we're gonna explore a little bit of the sort of 18th century uh, beginnings of the of uh, naval conflict and, and and establishing sovereignty and on the high seas. And then and then we're gonna move into uh, and we're gonna move into what actually happens when you have a navy uh, and when that navy and and Yankee whalers come together in the far off reaches of the world. So um, so it, uh, if you're just joining us, the nice thing about the Local History Guild is that you automatically become a member just by showing up. So it's a bit like history itself. We all play a part whether we want to or not. Um, this evening's companions in conversation are David R. Nelson and Gregory A. Gibson. <coughs> Excuse me. Dave is a bona fide local history guy who has a resume a mile long, including as a bookseller and author of New Bedford, A Postcard History seen here lovely book he is a member of our scholarship and publications committee and previous local history guild presenter for you uh you old timers who were way back there in the in the in the in the 2019 when we were meeting in person uh you may remember those old days when we used to sit down and talk together um dave dave did a really great uh conversation about the postcards and uh joining us also is uh, uh greg gibson who's been running a maritime bookstore, 10 pound Island book company since 1976 and stands today as the preeminent dealer in maritime manuscripts in the U S he has helped build the collections here at the museum. In fact, just last week, uh, Greg, a collection of papers relating to the Williams family of whaling fame that we acquired, uh, from you, uh, added a bit of a surprise to the family members who came, uh, to, to visit the museum and see some other Williams family stuff and, um, so that was that was nice. Um, uh, but you too have a resume a nautical mile long and, and have written several books. Uh, and tonight you'll be helping us deconstruct the US Navy's involvement in the famous mutiny on the ship globe of Nantucket. Beautiful book by Greg Gibson demon of the water. So we were supposed to have a third uh, member, uh, Mary Kay Burkhaw Edwards was supposed to be here. She too is a, uh, well, she's a Melville scholar and a Stump the Scholars stalwart and a scholarship and publications committee member. But she, uh, she was going to talk about Melville and the, the white jacket in the U.S. Navy, but, um, but she had something came up and she couldn't, uh, she couldn't be here. But nonetheless, we wish her and her family well, and we'll talk with Mary Kay another time soon. So, <clears throat> Let me um, let me explain this odd sort of marketing graphic that um, for this program tonight, uh, why why you might be wondering why a couple of title pages from classics of American maritime literature are juxtaposed on a 1750 mountain page sea chart, um, and the fact is that American sovereignty on the high seas only happened through the years of the American Revolution in the 1770s, early 1780s, and then eventually by the War of 1812. Um, in May of 1775, 1775, uh, this is, you know, right at the, right at the beginning of the war, um, one of the first naval battles of the, of the revolution took place right out here, right out here in Buzzards Bay, uh, on the chart behind me, um, when some local men armed the whaling sloop success. <clears throat> and sailed out into Bedford Harbor, out into Buzzards Bay to retake two prizes seized by uh, HMS Falcon. Um, so this is interesting, um, not just for the fact of the battle, but for the reality of the geography of the harbor. So it was a great harbor, recognized as a great harbor in 1602. By Bartholomew Gosnell, um, but it, it it proved itself to be a great harbor, not just for for the incipient 
whaling trade, but also for privateers in wartime. So a good harbor is a good harbor is a good harbor and privateers uh, used uh, Bedford Harbor um, uh, to go out and raid, uh, raid the British. And um, there was retaliation. And Dave Nelson can talk a bit about that retaliation and, uh, and where that all stands today because it has sort of stuck with us. Hey, Dave, answer me one question. If there had been a real American Navy, would the British, would you think the British would have attacked Bedford and Fairhaven in 1778? Um, probably not, but it was kind of a revenge kind of a thing, I thought, too, for the damage that was inflicted on the British prior to that. And so they were sort of taking revenge. I think it was General Gage who was uh, the, the, in charge of the whole operation. Uh, it's kind of a, a cruel kind of a guy, actually. They call him Bayonet Bay, uh, Gage or something because he preferred that his soldiers bayonet the, their, uh, you know, the, the enemy instead of shooting them. Uh, and uh, actually, there's the case in New Bedford uh, where three men were killed uh, in defense of, of the, it was Bedford then, of course, Bedford Village, uh, were accused, uh, were, were actually uh, going after the British when they marched up County Street. Uh, what happened was uh, three of them were killed. There's, there's actually a plaque on a boulder that nobody knows probably is there uh, between uh, Mill Street and North Street on the west side that commemorates the shooting of these three men. Uh, but anyway, uh, bayonets were used on these. Uh, one of them was shot dead immediately. The other two were wounded. And the British soldiers actually sliced up uh, the faces and uh, body of these two um, the Continental Army soldiers because they were they were conscripted locally uh, and were left there to die. Uh, they weren't dead yet, and uh, that's a pretty horrible uh, scene of war. We we tend to think the Revolutionary War. Don't think in terms of that kind of cruelty or violence, uh, but all war was cruel, and uh, that certainly was one case right here in New Bedford. Uh, where well, that took place to join the raid uh, by the British. And, you know, one thing that I've always, I've, that, you know, the, the study of this book has sort of raised, these were Quakers in New Bedford. And I haven't got to the, quite to the bottom of, the, were, were Bedford Quakers fighting? Um, I know the Fairhaven guys were fighting because they were fighting guys. But, the, but the, what about the Bedford Quakers? I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, some of them were Tories, actually. Some of them were Tories. Uh, I don't think too many of them were with the cause, actually. Uh, but there were also a lot of Baptists and other uh, yeah, right. religious elements in the city that went along 100% with uh, what was going on sure. uh, for the colonies. But anyway, in, in regards to uh, the, uh, the, the raid in New Bedford, uh, they marched through New Bedford up to the head of the river and into a cushion it slightly, and then took a, a turn into Fairhaven. And of course, that's where the whole thing comes up with the, uh, the West Family Bible, uh, when they arrived at the home of Bartholomew West. Well, you, uh, those are your people, aren't they? You, you're like direct yeah. descendants of those people. Oh, definitely, yeah. My grandmother was a West. Uh, her, her, uh, her father was a whaler, and her grandfather was a whaling captain, who was the last owner of West Island, uh, who was a West actually, um, which is off of Scotland. Is... Right here, right here on the... yeah. yeah, most people don't know that uh, that this was called West W S T apostrophe S uh, originally on most early early uh, oh, chat right. yeah. because it was West Stephen West Island, Anthony Stephen West, who was the uh, the son of uh, the, uh, the daughter of John Cook. So uh, and it's east of Scotland and Neck. So that goes so, way, way back. Yeah. So people uh, don't really know that sometimes. Uh, but to make a long story short and to get into uh, what I was trying to do, when I got elected to the legislature, I spoke with the state archivist and said, uh, could we do something about getting this Bible over back to this country? And uh, we talked and then uh, formed a committee. Uh, and I enlisted Dick Kugler of the Whaling Museum. who was a big help. Uh, and a good friend, and um, a, couple, a couple of other people, Ned Denman from Falmouth, who was in charge of the colonial militia in Falmouth, uh, Rita Steele, the librarian at the Fairhaven Library, and uh, Donald Bernard, who's the, uh, who was a local historian in Fairhaven, a great guy, 
who passed away too young, unfortunately, and author of Fort Phoenix, the uh, book on Fort Phoenix. Um, and so together we tried to uh, make moves to get back the Bible. And the Bible itself was stolen by the British during the raid, the House of Bartholomew, uh, Bartholomew West. So what happened was uh, the house, uh, they were burning, gonna burn the house down of Bartholomew. Uh, his caretaker at the time uh, dragged him outside and um, put him in a shed uh, so that he escaped the burning. Um, but they did take the Bible, which I thought was kind of unusual, but a Bible is not a spoils of war, actually. And that was the, uh, the case we're trying to present uh, later on. Uh, so anyway, they took this Bible and for a hundred years, uh, the West family didn't know what happened because they thought the Bible had been burned with the house. A family West thought, and he was a Mason, by the way, and he thought the Bible had burned, you know, he was the head of the lodge actually, had gone, gone down with the house, but it wasn't. They took it as a spoil of war. And throughout the engagements of this, uh, the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry Brigade, they went around the world, back and forth in battles here and there, Dominica, India, um, all over the world, um, Gibraltar, you name it, and carried the Bible with them. Uh, and one of the most recent stops in the mid in around 1870, they were in Bermuda and they had the Bible with them and it was on exhibit there. Someone came in and ripped a page out of the Bible. That Bible had the signature of George Washington and the fact that he took an oath of, uh, of the Mason Masonic oath on that Bible. And that was the, and that was the real value of this Bible, the George Washington uh, aspect of it. Not let to me, mention- Let me interrupt the, you here for a second. Hey, Greg, what's the likelihood of that signature turning up? Well, you're uh, well into six figures. Yeah. Right. So chances yeah. are good that it, that this is a marketable thing. Oh, yeah. I don't think it's a marketable thing anymore because it's a it's an heirloom. It's a piece of history. But the fact that George Washington even showed up as a part of this just takes it into another level yeah, in our yeah. history in in terms of marketability, in terms of the story, it just pushes it to another place. You know, Dave and I were chatting a bit about this and, and we were you know, thinking that maybe if we could bibliographically nail down that Bible exactly and take a look at the get, you know, take a look at the pages and the watermarks and everything else that, you know, a George Washington signature is a thing, you know, that's mm -hmm. a, that's a, that's something that's going to be, that, that, that is likely to have been saved and may well have turned up, turn up at some point or had turned up in the past uh, and being able to, you know, being able to, to, you know, say, well, who knows, you know, if the whole sheet is there, who knows? I mean, it's just 200 and some years ago, but you know, mm -hmm. if it's a whole sheet from a Bible and, and the paper's right and the watermark's right, that might be something that you might be able to put two and two together someday. Well, there's yes. no shortage of reference material about Bibles, believe me. And if George Washington had ever put his Hancock in there, it would be um, amazing. Well, he did, Greg, right, Dave? There is another wow. Bible. There, there is another a Masonic Bible, supposedly down in, uh, I think it's Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, where Washington also swore an oath. And, um, but I don't have any knowledge of that. And um, it is very well could be. And some, suppose it was a third Bible that someone claimed uh, the same thing, but uh, that's kind of like gone by the boards, I think. But the point uh, I want to make on this is that we tried everything. I mean, we got resolutions from the legislature. I spoke to Governor King personally about it. He says, great, we will put it in the state archives. And I said, no. I said, we want to put it into Bedford uh, at the Whaling Museum where it really belongs, you know, because it's the local um, you know, it's local history more than it is the actual state history. And um, we had Tip O'Neill on our side. Tip O'Neill uh, went after the British government. Uh, we spoke to the ambassadors of, uh, to this country and also the ambassadors in England through Tip O'Neill. Uh, Ted Kennedy got involved. Uh, and the answer always was, well, you know what? We wish we could do something, but uh, it's really in the hands of a private organization right now. It's not owned by the British government. 
So the Duke of Cornwall's museum, uh, which is in Cornwall, in Baden and Cornwall, um, has authority over the Bible. So we sent Ned Denman, who's from Falmouth and the militia over there to, to take a, a spin of trying to get it away from them. And uh, he said, if I have to, I'll just take, I'll just take it. He said, <laughs> uh, you know, bring it back. So uh, I said, Go, do what you have to do, Nate. So he went over there and uh, got into a, you know, a talk with uh, this Mr. Trelawney, I think it was. And uh, by the way, this is uh, over 40 years ago that this happened. Uh, and supposedly uh, he was friendly at first, but then his mood kind of turned and said, uh, well, uh, let me think about it, you know, because, uh, and then he came back and said, no, we're not going to really let it go. And um, so then we uh, kind of got into the point where it boiled down to all these, yeah, there's a picture. This is great. This is from the Ellis's history of New Bedford. There's an actual picture that was taken in the, around 1880 something. Look at that um, cool binding, huh? Yeah, yeah. that's nice. That's nice. That's yeah. got a Masonic binding from the 80s. Oh, it's good. Exactly. Blue velvet on. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Blue velvet. On. It's, it's really a remarkable item. And they, it's a showcase in this museum. They took it out of general exhibit and put it in a back room because they were afraid someone was going to steal it from New Bedford. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so where it stood was uh, that the English government, the British government said, the only way you're going to get this back probably because the government has no, really no control is to take it to the judicial system in Great Britain. And so we discussed this with the committee at the time, and the cost would probably be around ten thousand dollars, which was quite a bit of money. Um, and no one seemed to come up with ten grand, so it kind of just lingered. And um, Dick Kruger says maybe we shouldn't pursue it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, he said probably what we could do is the next time a British ship shows up in New Bedford behind the hurricane barrier, just close the barrier and keep the ship. He said, it was kind of a, a joke on his part, really. Pop it out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it's at. There have been other attempts, by the way, and I'm going to give credit to other people. Um, Alice West Clark, who passed away, she was also a direct descendant of the West family. She lived on Sconconnect, and she tried something. Uh, it didn't work. And then uh, we've had, uh, even recently, um, Kathy Delano, uh, who was very active in Fairhaven uh, Affairs and the Delano family, uh, as related to the Delano's, you know, as I am. And, and she said that um, she went to the museum. She knows somebody who lives in Bodmin. It might even be a relative. And um, they were talking about the possibility of going through the British courts and doing the same thing. Uh, and that was just as recently as a couple of years ago. So I think at this point, I kind of like your idea, Mike, of bringing the Bible on a loan, so to speak, uh, or an exhibit, uh, and and also involving a couple of other museums, you know, in it, including the Masonic Museum up in, is it Lincoln? Lexington. Lexington, rather, up in Lexington. And, uh, well, we don't necessarily have to return once it gets here, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's been gone for 200 years, but we, it still belongs here and we'd like we, to get it back. We, you know, <laughs> what happens to it when it gets to, to another institution is not my problem. That's we, right. I'm just kidding. Uh, but I think, you know, the possibility of this, I think it would be an interesting thing for the All Hand Show just because it, it's not, it doesn't relate immediately directly to the subject of Yankee whaling in the U.S. Navy, but it, would, but it does tangentially in that there was no Navy. Uh, and, yep. and this was a whaling port and a and a privateering port, and yep. uh, and it was it suffered because of there was no defense. Um, and just you know, as a as an aside, what defense there was were those cannons uh, down in right. Fort Phoenix, which were seized from uh, the Bahamas by the mm -hmm. what was his name Ezra Hopkins Ezra. Well. John Paul Jones was involved in that and, and the, um, and the, right. the first U.S. Navy expeditionary force. Uh, and they seized those cannon in the Bahamas uh, and they brought them back. And some of the cannon were installed at Fort Phoenix, um, right. but, but it didn't do any good. Um, even so, the, 
you know, British knew that, the, that there were cannon there. And so they landed on the Clark's Cove side. They didn't come into the harbor. They landed on the Clark's mm -hmm. Cove side and then came up the peninsula that way. So, you know. Well, they, they took uh, they took out about 60 or 70 privateers in the harbor and burned the harbor down. Yeah, I mean, yeah. total, a total wipeout. But I, I, I think New London was probably the capital of the privateers. But the Bedford was pretty close to second place, probably, uh, with a number of privateers <laughs> at the Bedford Village Harbor at the time. You know, one of the questions that has sort of plagued my research and um, has been that whether or not, to what extent the British actually protected colonial commerce. Um, and that, that was, that's been something that's been really bugging me. Um, but uh, I did come across a very interesting book by a, a man named Chapin, and it's called uh, Privateers of King George's War. Um, and in it, he talks about ship, you know, colonial shipbuilding, building men of war <coughs> to retaliate against French and Spanish, which, at, you know, this was in the 1740s. So that is, in fact, a British naval effort to protect colonial commerce, even if it was done by the colonists themselves, it was done under the auspices of the flag. And so, um, and that, you know, that frigate, it just blew my mind. I just love chewing on this. The frigate Massachusetts, right? The frigate Massachusetts built in Boston in 1744. And we couldn't even put a Navy together. And we had to actually fight to put a Navy together because, you know, Americans didn't really want to put a Navy together. It was expensive and and they didn't want to do it. And so, you know, it was, there's this, you know, these gigantic political ramifications in the, you know, in the, in the, in the revolution and afterwards about the creation of a U.S. Navy. You know, Mike, I yeah. think there's, there's something else going on here that ties right into that, that fascinates me. Because all this time, the Brits were mining us for our natural resources, mast ships, all the timber. They'd gone through all their timber. They needed their colonies, of course, to supply uh, raw materials, but in particular, timber and masts for the Royal Navy were in uh, great demand. They were highly protected by the Brits, and I'm sure that they protected whatever uh, aspect of colonial commerce involved getting those raw materials back across the ocean. Oh, I wonder, do you think they convoyed? I have no idea. I don't know, but we, I have no idea. worth looking at. Yeah. But I do know about the mass ships because it was a real issue in, in uh, pre-revolutionary America. Uh, Americans resented the mass ships because they were <laughs> removing their valuable natural resources. So there was a it, it's a very interesting political situation as well. Anything over 24 inches, white pine. Mm -hmm. And the King's Broad Arrow. Yep, the stamp. <laughs> right? So that's a fascinating history in itself. <clears throat> so, you know, at this, the story goes on and on. And I think that, I think that the Bible, I think we would, we might have a legitimate case, you know, to, to present for, you know, for a loan, uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, work with. Now, Dave, what's the connection with Virginia? Uh, the West family, uh, there was several branches of the West family also that interrelated, but uh, there was a bunch of West family members who lived, uh, who went from uh, Fairhaven area, uh, in the Bedford area, Bedford area, down to um, Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Uh, and some of them went to New Jersey, uh, to Monmouth County, New Jersey. Uh, and they were early settlers of New Jersey, and they were actually considered uh, founders of the state of New Jersey, believe it or not. And part of the, and I think part of that crew also went further south to Virginia, but there were also vessels that came into, into Virginia that had West people on them. Uh, and that was a hotbed of Masonic activity also uh, down in Virginia. So the, uh, the people who looked, and actually in Ellis's history in New Bedford, uh, there, was, there was a reverend uh, who was a Masonic uh, leader and he, tends to think that may be also a connection to the West Family Bible 
Uh, there you go. Ellis is fishing to Bedford. That's, he, Ellis did a great job. Uh, and uh, so I think there are some clues down in Virginia also that might be worth looking into. Hmm. We have a, uh, we got a question from Bob. I think it's probably Bob DeManch of Fairhaven. Is there any handwritten information in the West Family Bible, such as notes about Cook West Family members that could at least be scanned and made available? There are, there is a, yeah, there is a whole page of genealogy on the, uh, in the Bible. Um, I think starting with, um, actually it's one of the, I think it's either Stephen West. I think it's Stephen West. Uh, no, it's Mercy West. Mercy West was the daughter of, of John Cook. Uh, and uh, she's in the, um, in the Bible. So then it goes down to Stephen West and Samuel West. And there's another Stephen West, uh, there's John West. Um, then uh, you start to get into, I know my, my branch of it, when you get to Namaya West and H, John H.W. West. But uh, so there is a lot of information on the West family in the Bible. Also, that information is in Ellis's also, most of that information. Tell you what, we got a couple of questions here, and then we're going to move on to chapter two of our discussion here. Uh, Lee Brownell uh, writes, I'm born and bred in New Bedford, but tuning in from Ontario. And, uh, and Lee says that the, that the, that the King of France had uh, explorers in Canada brand the Royal R on the trees in Canada. Um, which, you know, you know, if you consider that, you know, think about, think about the Christmas Carol, good King Wenceslaus, you know, what a big deal it was that that peasant guy had, had to go out and gather wood uh, and, it's no joke, you know, I mean, there was no timber was left, there was no timber left. Um, and, you know, America, North America, what a treasure trove of oak and yellow pine and white pine and hickory. And I mean, just more than they than you knew what to do with. Um, so, yeah, it must have been a great thing for maritime nations to see those, see that stuff. Now, Alan Wyman wants to know, is there a possibility of an exchange with the British government for the Bible? And does New Bedford have anything that belonged to the British that they would like returned? And I bet that's that ship, right, Dave? That we want to close the barrier. Yeah, I, I actually, probably not. I actually, the, the British, you know, have, there is a, a history, not exact same history, of returning something that belonged to us, actually. It was the Pilgrim's Diary, uh, you know, that was actually on the Mayflower. Yeah. the Mayflower Diary, and uh, that was in England, and it was returned um, maybe, I'd say, 20 or 30 years ago, or maybe possibly 40 years ago, uh, to this country. So, but wasn't a, it wasn't in, it was from an actual uh, museum in England, and that was returned. Uh, so, it could be that the attitude is changing also, because we see not a lot of repatriation of museum items from one country to another. Yeah. You know, so, right, Greg? So, you know, so it's very possible there may be a, a more of a, a mood for this now uh, where things are returned to where they actually belong. The British so, Museum is starting to uh, morph from a great gatherer and preserver of the world's cultural traditions to a, a robbing yeah. operation. Yeah, and right. Then, you know, there's a lot of uh, hot button issues out there about the property that's in the British Museum being restored to the place where it came from. So in a way that the, the way the wind is blowing now, I think might be more favorable to something like that than it had been in the past. Oh, I think definitely, I, I absolutely agree with that. And Mike, I think this might be a, you know, a good time to probably work on what we were talking about. Well, we'll bring it up at s &P. Although yeah. again, it's a private, uh, this is this Bible is actually in the possession of a private museum, yeah. privately held, which right. that gets a, that's a whole nother level of complication there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been probably the big problem all along. Uh, but still, uh, it was taken as a spoil of war, and I think legally, uh, even with the law of the time, you couldn't really take religious items as a spoils uh, as a spoil of war. And so I think there's a, a very good legal case for this also. Uh, so. We'll have to see, but we'll keep working on it. Yeah, it's, it's worth doing, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if Ellis thought that it was important enough to photograph and put in the in the book, 
Yeah. And that was a long time ago. Was that 1886 or something like that? 1890? Yeah. Yeah. 1880. Yeah. Yeah. That, and this, this is a long history of this Bible. It's, it was the Bible itself was printed in 1712. So uh, that's the age, the original age of, of that particular Bible. Well, I tell you what, Benjamin West. Any relation to Benjamin West, the great painter? Uh, probably not. I think that might, so that's that's probably a Virginia line. And Benton uh, was asking whether Benjamin West, you know, Death on a Pale Horse, you know, the great. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, no, great painter. But I think he's more the uh, Virginia line of West. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happened was. Americans won their sovereignty after the War of 1812, free trade and sailors' rights. Um, we had a Navy. We had the USS Constitution. We had, we had uh, you know, the, the USS Essex. We had a number of uh, really powerful frigates. Uh, and we had, uh, you know, we, we pretty much beat the Algiers, the Algerians uh, in the Mediterranean. And uh, we had established rights uh, for American sailors on the high seas which meant that the whaling ports could, uh, could flourish once again. <clears throat> all those, all those uh, happy Quaker uh, merchants could pursue their, uh, their trade with a vengeance, as Melville said, uh, and they did. Um, and they started sailing out and, you know, by the, by the mid 1790s, they're in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and, uh, and, you know, after the, after the war of 1812, after the, after Porter's raid, uh, in the Pacific, um, you know, a, a, an American presence there was pretty much constant. Um, but there are some odd characters in the story. There are some fruitcakes and Samuel Comstock was one of them. Was he not Mr. Gibson? Well, he was a nut job. Sure. Uh, but let's not forget that by the time all this started coming about, I mean, it, it takes a political system to make a Navy. And by the time this highly dramatic story starts unfolding, we were in a very political situation in America uh, in terms of whaling, in terms of the Navy, in terms of our uh, first outreach, you know, trying to establish ourselves as a global power and Man, we went right on the heels of the whaling fleet into the Pacific. I mean, talk about interesting characters. Porter, that little banty rooster of a guy, he was, I mean, he just went out there without orders and, and pretty much neutralized the British fleet in the Pacific. So there were some great characters and some great individuals. But I think the whole sort of foundation for the story that I tell is, is a political story, is a social story. None of this happens. I mean, the only way it happens, the only way they go after these mutineers who did this horrible thing, somebody had to go to the government and say, listen, you have to help us establish order in the Pacific. And the government had to decide to do it. And the fact that there was a, just a bloody uh, massacre of a mutiny, I think, was a help in that, in that regard to uh, get the government behind it. The whale, the whale fishery was was fundamental to uh, to a commercial endeavor that needed protection. And you know, it, it turns up specifically in naval reports, you know, of of the time when there were there was a it was, there was a lobby, there was a lobbying effort on the part of the whale fishery. Mike, back in that day, whaling was big oil, and American politics listened to big oil then, just like they listen now. Those gentle Quakers and those industrious New Bedford merchants carried a lot of weight, I think, in the government. So what happened? Well, Samuel Comstock was, I don't know if, you know, I guess the equivalent today would be one of these crazy people that goes out and murders 50 people at a rock concert or something like this. He was a, he was a legitimate nut. <laughs> uh, he had a history in the whaling industry, he was a highly uh, capable individual. He'd been on whaling cruises before. Uh, and of course, on Nantucket, then probably all up and down the East Coast, there was a tremendous amount of prestige that went along with coming back as a successful, you know, 
anybody who had a an important part in a whaling voyage came back and they were they could just walk around town and the, the girls would love them and all this kind of stuff so that was important and it was important to this crazy guy but uh i think once he got on his final assignment aboard the globe he had a um what would you call a meltdown a psychological efflorescence of all his bad stuff and uh fomented a mutiny aboard the ship which involved some horrific uh physical stuff i mean it was grisly it was awful and of course that's the part of the story that people somehow really seem to be interested in because people are interested in that kind of stuff but to me as I said before, the interesting thing above and beyond all that uh, drama of cutting people up and all that sort of stuff was uh, the politics behind it, but also the um, transmission of information behind it, because it's a very shattered story. This guy mutinies, takes over the ship, uh, completely terrorizes the crew. He decides that he's going to sail to a desert island to become king, and they will all sort of like the bounty mutineers go on. Yeah, and he, was, he planned to do that before they ever even sailed. Indeed. He was looking at, he was gathering seeds. He was looking at seed catalogs. So this whole thing had been cooking in the back, but without this psychological break, believe me, Mike, it, oh, no, how, many sailors, <laughs> how many sailors go out there and dream of being a king on a desert island? I mean, come on. You know, but think about this. One thing, one thing I did want to throw in here, and 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 you know, Porter may, might actually come around in this in this regard. You know, that two volume you know Journal of a Cruise, there was an idea that that the world was your oyster, and that and, and David Whippy did it in the Fijis. Why couldn't why couldn't Samuel Comstock do it? So he had this idea that he could go out there and do that, and he almost did. Well. Yeah, if you call being on a desert island surrounded by hostile natives with uh, half the people that came with you wanting to kill you, which they ultimately <laughs> did, if you call that a success, I suppose. <laughs> and let's not uh, forget either. I actually, in the course of writing this book, I went out to Millie Atoll. It is not a... Oh, I didn't know that. It, it's not. Oh, yeah. Um, my son and I went out. I got, a, I got a pretty big advance for writing the book because of Heffernan's huge advance everybody thought oh it was uh, nat Philbrick in the heart of the sea was a bestseller so all of a sudden all these publishers giving out money to write a book about the next uh, nat Philbrick book so i got some money and my son and i went out there he's a photographer professional photographer and we spent uh the better part of two weeks on millie atoll the plane only comes on thursdays and then it goes away Nobody on the atoll speaks English except for the nurse. So it was a really, really interesting thing. And it gave us some sense of what Comstock had gotten himself into. And believe me, this was not a welcoming environment. Yeah, there it is. There it is. It's an atoll. It's an atoll with little, you know, little bits of water run between the various islands. But there's this gorgeous big thing in the middle. Physically, it's beautiful. Um, Visually, it's beautiful, but physically, it's really tough. It's really hot. You go in the ocean, you don't cool off, that kind of thing. So this is the, this is the environment into which Comstock thinks he's going to start a kingdom. Well, the whole thing was doomed Not from the start as, as he was doomed. So Comstock gets killed. Two of the uh, crew get uh, adopted by the natives who or I don't think that's correct uh, terminology anymore, by the indigenous people who were fascinated by whiteness. In fact, uh, I've read somewhere that the brides before they were married were secluded in dark places trying to get their skin to lighten up a little bit because white was really interesting to these people. So here's these two white boys. They killed everybody else, but the two white boys were uh, almost kept like pets. Was that Lay and Hussey? Yes, Lay and Hussey, who ultimately escaped to write the book that is basically all we know popularly about this episode. Uh, so they were, they were pets. Anyway, word, oh, but this is a very shattered story because a lot of parts of it go sideways. 
when Comstock uh, takes over the mutiny, some of the crew escape and they make it all the way back to Valparaiso. And word gets back to America that this terrible thing has happened. And then to me, the interesting part of the story begins because the word gets from Nantucket to New Bedford, to Boston, to New York, transmitted all down the East Coast. And every, I mean, I must have read two dozen newspaper accounts from various places of this incident. And everyone is slightly different, depending on the interest of the place it's coming from, depending on the writer who's reporting it. So it's a very uh, fascinating transmission of information. But finally, what happens is, again, big oil talking to the government, the people on Nantucket said, listen, you, we cannot have stuff like this going on. You guys got to go out there. We, our government, has to go out there and just lay down some law. So ultimately, they dispatched uh, the dolphin under uh, Mad Jack, who was quite a character himself. Quite a character himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Paulding, who was the immediate um, superior to a very interesting character named Augustus Strong, who was a, an ambitious uh, lieutenant, I believe, maybe less. But he wanted to write a book. You could tell he wanted to write a book. So he kept very careful notes about this thing, all oh, quite a great sort, of, sort of dogged up in a literary manner. He gets back. He never publishes them. His notes get lost until the, when was it? Late 90s, when they turn up in Vivi. Where is Vivi? Is it in Ohio? I can't remember. I went out there and looked for the goddamn thing. I, it was, it's in the Midwest. The thing turns out in the Midwest. And it's his account of what he did when they sailed in the Dolphin they had no idea that Comstock had been killed. They thought they were going out there to capture right. a crazy guy and fight natives or whatever. Well, of course, by the time they got there, this had been over for uh, the better part of it, two years. Um, but hey, hey, you know that there was a Lay and, Hus Lay and Hussey themselves moved to the Midwest and they published an account of their of the story, or one of them did at the Wisconsin Telegraph office in 1845. You bet they did. And you know that little map you held up of the inland sea? Yeah. That came from the Midwest. It's not It's not in Lay and Hussey. It's in a very uh, uh, obscure and recondite edition of oh. Hussey's narrative. So I had to go down to the Beinecke Library and find that dog. That's very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So they did. Well, again, let's get back to this. To yeah. me, sure, uh, crazy people uh, having grizzly mutinies are interesting, but Equally interesting to me is the way this news gets translated throughout our young country. I mean, we don't have internet, anything. We got letters and we got newspapers, but within, okay, this probably happens in January, 1824, the, the mutiny. And by the end of 1824, most of America already knows what's happened. And I find that fascinating. Because that's what starts the rest of the story. That's what gets the Navy out there. That's what gets Lay and Hussey to write their book. Blah, blah, blah. All of that. So uh, ultimately, what happened? Lay and Hussey came back. They were the two survivors. Everybody else is dead. Uh, except for the people who escaped. Some of them got, uh, oh, Justice Story of all people was charged with uh, determining if a couple of these guys were mutineers themselves. He said, no, let them, let them go. They just, you know, they were dragged along with this thing. Um, so it actually just fades back into history, but it was about the nastiest in terms of. Well, yeah, and it was also the, the first, the first naval police action in the Pacific Ocean. Well, yeah, I suppose you could say that because the next big one was Kuala Batu in the 1830s. That was our first gunboat diplomacy right. when they sailed out there and bombarded the hell out of this poor little island. Yeah, right. And that was only nine years later. So 
this was all in the in the in the first period of America flexing its muscles internationally, for sure. You know, Blackjack Percival and the Dolphin also, you know, that was a U.S. Navy crew that uh, visited Hawaii and acted badly. Yeah, yeah, they got in big trouble there with the missionaries. And and here's another theme that recurs and recurs and recurs. You know, you're on a ship for years. Yep. You land on shore and there's women there and there's other things to do. You're going to do them. And the what did he say my crew is on fire? <laughs> I think I think that was the quote. My crew is on fire and they wouldn't. They, and, you know, this caused riots in Lahaina with the whaling fleet on yep. two separate occasions. Um, yep. So, you know, sex was a big deal. And uh, and, you know. The U.S. Navy, those guys should have known better. I mean, they, you know. I think some of that was you could put right on Mad Jack's shoulders. I think that yep. I think there were still some loose cannon. Well, Porter, our great hero, even then, he was a loose cannon. For sure. Mad Jack Percival was a loose cannon. So I guess I think now the Navy would be more circumspect in their international behavior than they were in 1822. <laughs> Well, uh, let's hope so. Yeah. Not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, not necessarily either. <laughs> Have you handled copies of these books, Dave? Uh, I've handled Greg's book many times. Actually, I'm all out of them, Greg. Uh, I think I think we can help. Yeah, okay. Um, but no, some of the early ones you're talking about? No, not Tom really. Stock's narrative. Which one? Comstock's narrative, the, the bloody mutineer and awful whaleman. Yeah, uh, the Comstock narrative. There yeah. are two. There are two books about Comstock. One written by his brother, and one written by some popular journalist. Uh, mm. And they're both quite scarce. I think the one written by the brother is the rarest of all. I sold a copy to Dick Kugler back yeah. in nineteen eighty, whatever. Right. He'd never seen one. I'd never seen one. It was, it was quite rare. That's a, rare, that's a rare. That's a rare copy. I almost used that copy for the advertisement for the marketing thing, but uh, but I had a I had a photograph of the other one, so I used that one instead. Also, Paulding uh, wrote an account of his voyage in the Dolphin, and for some reason, that's even harder to find than the account that Lay and Hussey wrote about their experiences. Lay and Hussey again. Let's remember were the two kids who got. Uh, saved because they were made pets by the natives and ultimately rescued come back to the united states they write their narrative that narrative is actually more common than paulding's narrative of you know sort of the official account of what happened out there i've only ever seen the reprint of paulding's account i've never actually seen a first i don't think we have a first edition of paulding's account they're pretty scarce yeah but you can get the reprint editions pretty easy. Well, yeah, I suppose you, you get a uh, print on demand now, but that second edition they did in the uh, in the early 20th century is pretty hard to find too. So, not that it, I mean, this is just book talk. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the history of the thing. Well, I, well yes, yes and no. no I mean, so, yeah, sure, books are history. I tell you, you know, when I, another point of all this is the fact that people like Paulding and Lay and Hussey and hundreds of others realized that writing a book was an option for them. That's not something that your average 20 year old, you know, kid who, you know, is, comes back from whatever adventure they're going through the idea that, Oh, I'm going to sit down, write a book and people will read this. And people will read it. They do read it. They read them to pieces. We know that's a bestseller. That's why it's more available than the Paulding book, which is not much at all. Uh, you know, the public library, the bookstore, you know, these aren't quaint notions. These are vital to your earlier point. Uh, it may take a little while, but not that long. I mean, Elisha Dexter's narrative came out like within six months of his shipwreck. He had to get it out there because his ship wasn't insured. So he needed to sell. And the same thing with that, uh, with that, that Cornelius Hulsark. You sold us that fabulous 
William Roach, uh, ship William Roach. Uh, remember that? That when uh, I can't remember anything. I know you, you said it to me. At the, this was at the Kendall, and I was like, "What happened on this date? Did uh, did this guy lose his arm on that date?" And you looked it up and said, "Yeah, this guy lost his arm on that date." And I said, "We're going to buy it because that's the voyage that Cornelius Halsart lost his arm." Uh, um, ah, yeah, uh, that's important. And, yeah. So Halsart comes back. And not only does he write a plagiarized account to sell, but he's such a pitiable figure that the artists in New York City take his, well, he must have had an illustrated journal and created those two fabulous prints, um, you know, the capturing a sperm whale and a shoal of sperm whale off the Isle of Hawaii. And that ties in with the whole tradition of the mendicant uh, literature. These guys had come back, they'd be ruined, they'd be physically destroyed, they had no hope of making an income but they could write a poem, they could tell a story and hope to make some money from that. And I suspect, I probably researched it. In, it might even be in the, in the book, but I can't remember anymore. I suspect that either Lay or Hussey, one of them really wanted to write the book and the other one didn't want to have much to do with it. One of them was uh, motivated for just that reason. They come back, they've got nothing waiting for them. Well, let's see if we can write a book and capitalize on our experience. Right. That's what makes you guys, your jobs so interesting and my job so interesting as well. And I think probably most of the people that are that are attending tonight, you know, uh, you, this stuff exists and it didn't exist in a vacuum. And, you know, you find it, we acquire it, we preserve it. We put it on exhibit and then and then scholarship surrounds this and we can talk about it and uh, and keep these stories alive and, and think about them a little bit more. Um, so it's about we're about five minutes till the end. And I, I see that uh, a, one of the Williams family descendants uh, who attended has had to bow out. So she Judy's gone. Um, but um, we've got about five minutes left. And I don't know if uh, anybody anybody. Who uh, who's out there has uh, anything on their mind that they that they want to uh, talk about? Um, but um, so I'm thinking that this all hands project uh, might have to be a sort of a collaborative thing. I think it might be better that way than my trying mm -hmm. to write it all myself. Because you know, I think that's the way to go. Definitely, Mike. Uh, and you got the right people that you know, Greg and others who could contribute to that. You know, without too much of a, an effort to put into it on your part, as far as your other duties and everything else. I mean, how do you have time to write a book? You know what I'm saying? It's <laughs> it's such a massive project. And I know it's part of your job, probably to, to do that, to bring in some money. But still, when you're doing trying to, you know, just going to do so much uh, in, in a position like yours, so that it would kind of make sense. It's such a huge... When I started looking, when I read your manuscript and I looked into the topics myself, I said, this is endless. <laughs> you know, it's as endless as the ocean. You know what I mean? It just goes on and on and on. And I'm reading books about the Barbary pirates and uh, all, you know, before the U.S., you know. And I got, actually, I got a great title. It's um, Jefferson's War, the, the First War on Terror, which was about his war against the Barbary pirates. It's a really good read. Um, but... Uh, to protect the commerce, the whalers, and everybody else that was out there. Uh, and then they finally got rid of the Barbary pirates, but it was a struggle, you know? And they were, and the pirates were everywhere. And Greg, you probably know that more better than I do. They were in China, they were all over the place, uh, robbing uh, ships. And, and uh, well, we think of them as pirates. I think that for many uh, cultures, it was just a commercial activity. Oh, yeah, yeah, just right. A way of, a way of, yeah, it was a way of living, a way of life. You're, you're right. To us, it's piracy. To so those like, guys, they were just trying to make a living. So sort of like the tax collectors. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just the quality, but two, they got caught. <laughs> uh, I wonder if I can find that. I've got a wonderful uh, broadside illustration of the battle, of, you know, the Navy guys on the whatever it was, it wasn't an actual, it was a little island in the village, a, a, a wood engraving of these guys, a contemporary wood engraving of these guys destroying the natives. It's amazing. Some mm. 1833. Yeah, mm. it was brutal. Wow, yeah. And, 
you know something along the same lines, and another reason why this project is so is so uh, heavy. Um, the same thing happened uh, during the U.S. exploring expedition, where I think it was on it may have been Samoa, maybe, um, where there a, a Yankee whaleman got in trouble and somebody killed him, and. Um, and the uh, U.S. Exploring Expedition bombed the town flat. That'd be welcome mm. for you. Yeah. And mm. and this was a New Bedford. I actually, in my research, <laughs> I actually found the guy's name, the instigator of this whole thing. He was a New Bedford guy, a New <laughs> Bedford native. And I think he had too much to drink, and they got in a fight, and somebody killed him. And um, and uh, who who was the who was the commander of the U.S. Wilkes? And Wilkes oh, actually uh, commanded uh, that they bombard the town. Well, yeah. and he was a very headstrong guy, so that would fit right in with his personality too. Yeah, let's let's bomb him. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, guys, this has been a hoot. Um, thanks so much for everything. Uh, we, you know, we've got another. Um, we have another local history guild coming up, um, and this is September 9th. So September 9th, we have. Um, Van Gossi, uh, Van Gossi's first reconstruction, black politics in America with a chapter on the black electorate in the 19th century in New Bedford. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, and, and so that's something to look forward to. And then he has a co-author who's going to be joining him uh, for the conversation. So that's going to be on Thursday, September 9th. And uh, Dave R. Nelson and, and Gregory Gibson, uh, Thank you both for your time and your chatting and your conversation and your ideas. Thanks, Mike. It was a lot of fun. My pleasure, Mike. Enjoyed it. Nice seeing you both, and, and we'll we'll be in touch by and by. We've got things to talk about. We got a lot to talk about. Okay. Yep. Good, Good night. Night, Greg. Yep. Good night, folks. <laughs>